a structure built to reach to the heavens. Greetings old world explorers. In this video we're going to be taking a look at the largest city in Canada, Toronto. And we just had to begin with the old city hall. Uh, 10 years to build this structure, 1889 to 1899. Featured in several of uh, my other videos, but a uh, magnificent structure. Certainly not befitting of the 1800s, according to our narrative. Constructed in the Romanesque revival style made primarily of sandstone. And as we proceed through the video, we, we will be moving fairly quickly through a lot of these visuals. Uh, feel free to press the pause button if you want to take a closer look. And we begin in the 1830s. Uh, we have a population of around 9,000 in 1834. By the turn of the 20th century, uh, the city of Toronto has about 230,000 people. Most of what you're seeing will be, of course, from that time period. And I invite you, as we look through these visuals, to try to wrap your head around what it would take to construct these buildings with the means at their disposable um, at that time period according to the narrative we have been given about history and a little bit of history for the region in 1813 as part of the war of 1812 the Battle of York ended in the town's capture and plunder by US forces American soldiers destroyed much of the garrison set fire to the Parliament buildings York was incorporated as the City of Toronto on March the 6th, 1834, which the, is the day our census um, begins as well, according to the Wikipedia write-up. Toronto's early population of about 9,000 included African-American slaves, some of whom were brought by the Loyalists at the time. And of course, the City of Toronto grew, grew rapidly throughout the following decades. By the 1850s, we are told the Irish-born population um, was the largest single ethnic group in the city. We are also told in the 19th century, the city built an extensive sewage system to improve their sanitation. And of course, the streets were illuminated with gas lighting as a regular service. Of course, gas lighting. And don't forget the railway lines, of course. 1854 being the marker linking Toronto with the Upper Great Lakes area. Interesting fact as well, during the late 19th century, Toronto became the largest alcohol distillation center in North America. The Gooder, Ham and Warts distillery operation becoming the world's largest whiskey factory in the 1860s. And of course we get to the horse-drawn streetcars, which predated the electric streetcars because of course there was no electricity. Um, but they had the foresight of building these streetcar structures with the horses pulling them uh, until electricity came about, which came about in Toronto, we are told, in 1891. Now I think we have to mention as well the Great Toronto Fire of 1904. And I'll put some pictures up just to give you an idea of the devastation that took place at the time. We are told, according to Wikipedia, again, that the fire destroyed more than a hundred buildings. And we are also told that the fire claimed one victim 
John Croft, who was an explosive expert clearing the ruins from the fire. So again, we have that narrative of using explosives um, to aid in the cleanup of the fire devastation. Of course, we know we can link the, uh, the devastation of that happened in many of these major cities, particularly in North America, uh, Chicago, Boston, Baltimore, Seattle, Calgary, Vancouver, uh, the list goes on and on. Um, the major fires that were basically um, a hard reset start date, I think, for, uh, for many of these locations. And of course, Toronto, um, you can put in that category as well. Now let's just put this in perspective for a moment, shall we? Uh, if we're to say that there were just over 200,000 um, people living in Toronto at the turn of the 20th century, uh, most of what you're seeing in this video uh, attributed to the late 1800s, sometimes early 1900s, uh, as having been built. Uh, the amount of able-bodied working men, because at the time it was uh, certainly a gender divide as far as the workforce goes, um, would have had to have been, well, let's see, let's see if, if we're accounting children as well, accounting for children as well, um, should we say 50 to 70,000 um, able-bodied working men potentially in this area? And let's not forget the um, employment opportunities in places like the massive distilleries, in the railway sectors, uh, and of course the professional working class as well. So how many able-bodied men does it leave us um, to build these structures? And then of course you have to factor in the skill level um, and when we think about all the construction that's going on all over the rest of the continent at the time, uh, we can't use the narrative that um, skilled hands were brought in to build these buildings because that, that they would have been needed in their region as well. So the narrative, the historical narrative and what we're looking at with our eyes, of course, as always, does not jive and so we have to conclude that there's a deception going on here and th there is much more to the story than we have been told as always and of course we have the brick paved streets with the uh, rail lines running through them, looking very old and worn down, not fitting the historical narrative. Have a deep history in Toronto of uh, British colonialism as well, of course. Um, Canada as a whole, um, reflecting that. And so you have a bit of a military presence that goes along with the uh, with the crown. And of course, the uh, if you if you're familiar with the inheritors' narrative, you'll know that the um, crown and many of the religious centers, such as the Vatican, um, responsible for resetting of these uh, New World locations, and much of it going on in the 1800s. And as it relates to things like Antiquitech, which in this field of research has to do with um, the architecture of the buildings of the old world um, being built in such a way that they harmoniously harness the energy of the ether and incorporate that into the structure of the building. The level of per perfection in much of the details uh, of the visual, um, how visually pleasing they are, all these things seem to factor in. And what, what often look like um, details um, for visual sake, such as this one, um, have more to do, or as much to do with um, energy itself. So what we're looking at in this field of research is a, um, a hijacking of 
a devastation destruction of an old world civilization um, which was much more in harmony um, with um, the energy available to us in this reality something we are now have now been removed from uh, and then of course the implementation of the new world through the forces I recently spoke of um, taking us away from this um, way of existing um, getting us more involved or dependent on um, petrol petroleum so they're taking us off old modes of transportation and old methods of existing old ways of being and thinking and what we're looking at here really are the relics of a past civilization and the overtaking of these relics and usurping them let's say and repurposing them to fit uh, the narrative that we ha now exist in in this modern day. So if you're new to this field of research, it is very interesting, it's very difficult sometimes to wrap our heads around it if we haven't, uh, if we're not open to it, let's say. We have been indoctrinated into their world, really, uh, their system. Um, it, goes hand to hand with the education system, our social status system, um, all of these things. And it, it's very difficult to uh, detach from what we've known to be true our entire lives and explore new avenues of, of uh, perception, let's say. But I, we are at a point now in this field of research, I would say, where it's undeniable that there has been a massive deception um, having to do with our history, the rewriting of history itself. Um, they say history is written, written by the winners, and I would suggest um, never a more accurate statement was made. And when the winners rewrite history, they rewrite it in their favor, obviously, and seek to eliminate anything um, that might subvert their power structure or their grasp on that power structure. Uh, a little more research into this uh, old world historical deception will reveal the asylum narrative and the implementation of the new education system and those two things going hand in hand not to mention uh, the orphan trains the distribution of orphan children throughout the realm and of course all of this tying into the numerous wars uh, occurring down through that historical um, timeline and of course I do not believe that the details of these wars are accurate as well, of course, because they're being written by these same forces that need to maintain their position in this reality. And of course, if you don't resonate with any of this research, at the very least, I hope you can enjoy the visuals and appreciate these structures for, the, for what they are. As is often pointed out in this research, the uh, horse and buggy um, lifestyle of the 1800s um, completely contradicting the uh, enormity of many of these structures and the uh, plausibility of what it would take to build these. Not to mention the excavation, if you can see here, basement windows in almost every one of these structures. Uh, implying either massive excavations being done by shovel in the 1800s or possibly um, what we call the mud flood, uh, some sort of devastation have, having changed the level of 
soil, I suppose, or mud in our uh, landscape. And of course, there's much evidence to suggest that has happened in, in multiple locations. All you have to do is look a little further into this research. Anyway, this has been a quick peek into old world Toronto, particularly of the 1800s. I hope you enjoyed it and I thank you for joining me.